understanding the premises of capnography, if you will really pay attention here and then that little article that I sent out to you guys, um, and then just, you know, just read over it. Um, as far as the, the, the pathophysiology or the, the, the physiology should be a little bit of a review for you. Um, but as far as the waveforms and things like that, it, it, it's, it's a pretty simple um, 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 concept if you, uh, you really just, just really put on your thinking caps for the next two hours and, and um, try to uh, visualize what we're looking at and, and, and how we um, look at this stuff. Just like when I tell you that, that with an EKG, we're going to use that EKG readout as a map of what's happening electrically in the, uh, the heart. We're going to look at that catenography waveform as a map of, of the, the expiration, breathing out. So when we look at a waveform, all we're doing is we're looking at the amount of CO2 that's being breathed out upon expiration. That's what your, your different monitors look at and all that. So again, I don't want this to be something that, that is um, very intimidating to you because it, it should not be at all because uh, I feel like it's going to be a pretty easy concept on what we need to know for our standards. So what is capnography? Well, capnography is a non-invasive continuous measurement of exhaled carbon dioxide concentration over time. You've got a couple of different ways that you can view this or monitor this. You've got um, <coughs> your, your, your digital display where it gives you the ETCO2, ETCO2, in tidal CO2. It'll give you the number, all right? Or you've also got where you get a waveform that's on a graph that will also give you a number, but it also gives you a visual representation of really the pipes <laughs> as you're expiring out, as you're breathing out. I'll elaborate on that more in just a minute. Why is it important? Why do you think it would be important for us to continuously monitor CO2? What can that tell us? Okay, all right. So, so it, will, it will tell us that we're having gas exchange, which in, in turn will tell us what? That we're, we're getting perfusion, all right? Not necessarily that the CO2 is what's providing perfusion, but we know that the CO2 at the end of its long journey throughout the blood system and back to the alveoli is a what? Byproduct of perfusion, right? So, why... Why does, does this provide us a little more information than just SPO2? Okay, yes, and so that is one of the things. It does give you a real-time view of what's happening on, on the, the <coughs> metabolic processes of the body, referring to perfusion. Also, SpO2, it just tells me what? Right. How many heme uh, receptors or heme molecules does a red blood cell have? Four. Four. All right. So a red blood cell has a pretty high affinity or a love for oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. But there's other things that could very easily make that red blood cell stray away from the oxygen and it loves other things a little bit more. Or, it may still have a love for oxygen but it isn't quite as strong because it's getting a little bit of loving because it's being saturated with some other molecules. All right. But with CO2 monitoring, it's going to tell you in real time what's happening as far as when you expire <laughs> out. With your oxygenation, with your SpO2 monitoring, it may take a couple of minutes for you to really start seeing the values change. Why is that? It's in the periphery versus your center. It's what? It's in the periphery versus your center. Okay, all right. 
So yes, y'all y'all are all y'all are all on on to something there. It, it's in periphery. It's looking at the capillaries. Uh, it's looking at the 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 um, saturation of oxygen. Like, yeah. Okay. All right. So so yeah, um, we're we're actually looking at the amount of available oxygen before perfusion. Right. Think about the concept of hands only CPR. Why do we teach the, the, the public to do hands-only CPR? Well, first and foremost is because we know that a lot of bystanders or a lot of folks just walking by may see Mary and fall out and they don't know what she's got in her mouth so they're going to be more tempted to not... Uh, sorry, I, that sounded a lot worse than what I meant it to. No, I really should just stop using y'all as examples. Uh, well, somebody, I'm, I'm walking by Greg's office and he's fought out and I don't know what in the world Greg's been into, you know, and, and so I'm going to be like, no, I'm not going to put my mouth on him and, and, and I think that, that that's part of CPR so I'm just going to kind of call 911 and, and, and hope, whatever. But we teach now to do hands-only CPR because, What? That's right, that's right. You, you, you still have oxygen saturated on, on the heme molecules, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when we're doing those compressions, we're, we're bringing in some ambient air as well. Think about when we talked about RSI and we talked about uh, pre-medicating and then pre-oxygenating and how they would put them on a high flow um, for a couple of minutes to get that oxygen very good and saturated but then take it off. What is that SpO2 going to read for a couple of minutes probably? High 90s, 100%. Right? And so, even though they are not actually breathing, they still have that saturation. Now, on the flip side of that with CO2, every time that patient expires out, whether it's from a, a, a um, spontaneous respiration or from a manual ventilation, we're going to read changes. We're going to read changes each time. And we're going to see trends each time. All right? So both of those are very important monitoring tools, but CO2 can give you a lot of information about what's happening post um, um, oxygen delivery. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> so with capnography, you've got a couple of terms here that, that, that are kind of hand in hand, but um, Um, capnograph, <laughs> electrocardiograph. What's the what's the common term there? Graph. Graph. So what do you think capnograph? It's the yes, and then capnogram. All right, capnometry. All right, then you've got your entitled CO2 is what we're actually looking at there. <clears throat> then there's these two terms here, and and they are. Um, a little bit different, but they correlate together. You got your PETCO2, partial pressure of end tidal CO2. Then you got your partial pressure of arterial CO2. When do you think you would see the PETCO2, the pet code? While we're while we're breathing out, so we're we're actually measuring the amount of of, of uh, uh, the amount of CO2 or the pressure that uh, of CO2 that's being exerted on the the air that's coming out, right? Where would you read PaCO2? Arterial blood. Arterial blood. Arterial blood. <coughs> now, PaCO2 is not really a reading that we get in the field. Why? <laughs> Right, you have to do AVGs to get that. But, but, what research has found is that there's usually not a big difference between the saturation or the, the, the um, partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood as compared to the partial pressure of um, CO2 that's breathed out. All right? So, so really what that means is, is that, that, what's happening in the body 
with these physiological processes, they should kind of match um, with what's in the arterial blood as far as and, and what's coming out of, of the, um, the body. Now, um, with your capnometry, this is your number. Now, what numbers are we looking for? Y'all know this part. 35 to 45. All right. Now you may you may read that that, that some experts say that the numbers are um, they're, they're kind of variable there. They you, some folks may say it, it, it's a little bit lower than 35, but we want to kind of stay with the standard of 35 to 45. Now, if I've got a patient that that I'm monitoring and their their CO2 is hanging out 32, 33, something like that. And I know I'm delivering good respirations. They're getting ventilated. Their color's good. Oxygen saturation's good. Not a big deal, right? But if I start seeing that number drop, then I may know that I need to to make some adjustments if I'm ventilating. Or if I see that number start to climb, and I see that waveform start to look a little different, I may need to change uh, the way that I'm doing things with that patient. All right. With your capnogram or capnograph. Um, <clears throat> a waveform display of carbon dioxide over time. It is on a graph, okay? It is on a graph where this is measured in length, all right? So if you've got a wider waveform, that means that they're having a longer expiratory time. If you've got a shorter waveform, that means that they've got a shorter expiratory time. Now when you look at the vertical plane of this graph, this is where you're going to get your numbers, all right? So this says that this is 40 millimeters of mercury, so that tells me at the plateau right here, the highest point, if I correlate that with my graph, this should be 40. This would be 35, 30, 25, 20, so on and so forth. So wherever I see my plateau of my waveform, that's going to be what my peak level of uh, expiratory CO2 is. Does that make sense? Good. All right. Now, there's several different um, devices that you can use, and there's even portable devices that, that, that are being used. They're very expensive. So for the most part, most services uh, elect to, to use the, the monitor. I have a question. About that. You said you can tell. Not not with with that, but you can. This can give you an indication here, okay. and then looking at their overall, you know, perfusion status and, and and everything else that goes along with that. Now you're not going to really get a lot from acidosis, alkalosis, really from anything here but the numbers. Now what you would have to do is correlate because we're going to talk about a couple of different waveforms, and you would have to correlate what that waveform looks like then look at your numbers and then maybe base your treatment off of off of that okay. all right and i'll elaborate on that a little bit more in just a moment all right um so we know that your co2 is your normal end uh byproduct of metabolism that's what we want to see now the body likes its numbers and so um even though <coughs> co2 is a byproduct of of metabolism co2 is a waste gas that that's created the body also depends on those levels of CO2 to be maintained in the body to maintain what? Homeostasis with the acid-base balance, right? So it does want a degree of this, this CO2 circulating in the blood to help keep them from getting too basic, right? And then they also, uh, the body wants a, a degree of, of um, the other ions to, to keep it from getting too acidotic. Um, now, CO2 um, is detected by using either color metric or infrared device where, where it samples, okay? Color metric is what y'all are used to, right? You're used to the yellow means yes, litmus paper. Is that a monitoring tool? No, it is not. What is that? A confirmation tool. It's a, so it, it helps me confirm that I'm getting CO2 from the lung. Right. Um, 
So what do we really want um, when we're monitoring? We want the numerical value. We want to see that. And we want to see the waveform. Okay? The numerical value is going to be kind of like when you've got your EKG hooked up to the monitor and you've got your real-time heart rate. It gives you a quick reference of what the heart rate is, but then you look at the actual waveform to see what's going on in the heart. Well, that's kind of the same thing here. Um, you've got your number here, and that gives you a real-time number of, of what your levels are, and then you look at your waveform to see what is uh, going on as far as when they expire. Um, <clears throat> your respiratory rate is detected from the actual airflow, so what's going in and what's going out. We know that. But what I want you to really understand what I really want you to understand, especially when we get into looking at waveform, is that this waveform is a measurement of the concentration of CO2. All right? So this waveform is measuring the amount of CO2 that comes out. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you're inhaling, you actually aren't going to get anything. When you exhale, that's when it spikes up and comes down, okay? All right, so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these partial pressure um, definitions here um, simply because we went over these before and the main ones that I want you to know for, for this lecture are um, the, the PETCO and the, um, the PACO2. Now, one of the things you will notice is that this, both of these are the same letters, but this is a capitalized A, so this is actually the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli. All right? Now, your PaO2, that's the partial pressure of O2 in the arterial blood, which is not going to be um, exactly the same as your SpO2 right? Your SpO2 is your saturation of, our, um, of uh, the, the oxygen percentage in the blood, whereas your uh, PaO2 is the partial pressure of the oxygen that, that is in the blood itself. So, so we're actually looking at two different things. Here we're looking at how much is saturated on the hemoglobin molecule, whereas here we're looking at how much of, of the oxygen is actually circulating in the blood itself. All right, does that make sense? So, SpO2. <coughs> the actual blood molecule itself and the other one is checking the overall. Now, why, why does that what bearing does that have on us um, in the field? Not a lot other than understanding what we're, we're looking at and what we're working with because we're not going to draw blood gases and, and adjust ventilatory settings and things like that based off of blood gases. Our main monitoring when it comes to this is going to be that in title <coughs> All right. So, just quickly understanding carbon dioxide and, and, and the terms here. Capnos comes from the Greek word for smoke. Smoke from the fire of metabolism. Alright, so what we're, what we're saying here essentially is we're using this um, um, analogy that, that, that when metabolism occurs in a cell, we're, we're, we're um, Comparing that to a fire, and the byproduct of fire is smoke. The byproduct of metabolism is CO2. All right. It is a compound molecule where you have uh, two elements of oxygen and then the carbon element. All right. It is colorless and heavier than air. Why do we talk about this? Because to a degree, we, we, we do want to understand the disassociation of, of CO2 and understand how it is actually transported in the blood um, and understand that, that, that it actually is broken down and, and then broken down into hydrogen and, and um, some other elements as well. All right. So um, CO2, um, it enters the blood and then most diffuses into the red blood cells which uh, contain the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. 
The enzyme catalyzes the reaction of carbon dioxide and water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then disassociates or dissociates, um, creates a bicarbonate ions which diffuse out of the red blood cells into the plasma, which leaves the hydrogen ions and they enter the red blood cells. When the blood reaches the lungs, an area of lower PCO2, these reactions are reversed. CO2 is reformed and diffuses into the alveoli, eliminated during exhalation. Now, all those big chemistry terms and everything that we're talking about there um, leads to this. Yes, CO2 is a byproduct of metabolism, but, but there's only a very small portion of CO2 as its CO2 element that is uh, transported in that form in the blood. So what has to happen? Well, it actually has to, to, to um, come out and disassociate into to, um, um, different acids or the carbonic acid, and then it's carried to the lungs, um, and then it reassociates into CO2. All right. Now, it's actually um, this is we had this discussion a while back, and it, it, it's actually um, um, carried mostly in the form of the bicarbonate ion, bicarbonate, two carbonate ions there, um, and then it it, it, it um, forms back into CO two to be exhaled out. Now. The, the point of that is for you to understand that, that CO2 as a gas is typically not transported throughout the blood as CO2. It has to come, um, it has to break down um, um, chemically in order to be transported throughout the blood and then as it hits that alveoli, it then associates back into CO2, all right? And then that's what we're going to be reading as we're breathing out, all right? Um, so 5 to 10% of the CO2 is uh, carried uh, in the plasma, dissolved in the plasma, whereas uh, um, 20 to 30% is uh, bound to the hemoglobin. Now with the hemoglobin, I mentioned earlier that, that the hemoglobin, we, we like for it to have a high affinity for oxygen, right? In, in cases where you, you are hypercarbic, you've got high CO2, you may have more CO2 bound to the hemoglobin. What's going to happen if you have more of a percentage of hemoglobin that is bound with carbon dioxide? What's going to happen? Right, you're going to have issues with, with oxygen saturation because that CO2 is, is bound to the, the uh, hemoglobin and, and the CO2 makes the hemoglobin have a lower affinity for the oxygen. All right. But most are carried as bicarbonate ions, HCO3, 60 to 70 percent. Those bicarbonate ions have to come back. We can't breathe out bicarbonate ions. So they have to come back and reform CO2. All right? At the end of the expiratory cycle, the airways are filled with CO2 free gas. Why? At the end of the inspiratory all cycle. Huh? All, over now. all right. End of inspiratory. <laughs> That's right. You, you just breathe in and you just fill it up with oxygen. The, the ambient air that we're breathing in right now we know is has got a, a partial pressure of 21% oxygen. Um, mostly, mostly nitrogen, right? And then, then some other trace elements, right? Um, and so at the end of the inspiratory cycle, as we're breathing in, there's no CO2 there. Now why is that thrown in here in relation to CO2 monitoring? Because it's going to be baseline, it's going to be zero. So that's going to give me the indication that I'm breathing in, right, when I've got a flat baseline. When that CO2 starts to diffuse across the, the alveolar membrane, and starts to come out of the bronchioles, then we're going to start seeing that peak, or we're going to see that rapid incline of CO2. Now think about the way that you breathe. <sighs> mm. 
my inspiratory time is a lot shorter than my expiratory time, right? As I'm breathing out, I have a rapid amount of air initially that comes out, and then I kind of plateau, all right? As I'm breathing out, the pressure stays about the same as I'm, all right? And then, as that CO2 finally gets out of my system, if I'm measuring CO2 on a waveform, and my CO2 starts to drop, what am I going to expect my waveform to do? Start to drop, right. And then, as I start to take my breath in, I'm going to see it rapidly decrease and then go back to that baseline. Okay? Um, and this is pretty much what we had talked about. Y'all understand that. Y'all should understand that basic premise there. Alright? So, um, the evolution of CO2 from the alveoli to the mouth during exhalation and inhalation of CO2-free gases during inspiration give the characteristic shape of the CO2 curve which is identical in all humans with healthy lungs. Now essentially what that says is that just like with a normal sinus rhythm you expect the same parameters. You expect a, a normal looking P wave, a good QRS complex, and a T wave. It's so going to be the same thing with healthy lungs. If you are inspiratory or if you're inspiring and expiring healthfully then every one of us in here, if we all right now are breathing normally, we should ha have very close to identical CO2 waveforms. Okay? And so this is what we mean here. Now what did I say earlier, flatline? That's going to be your inspiration, right? So if you can imagine a graph right here, this being zero, and if this is a normal waveform, this being 35, as I'm breathing in, I'm not measuring any CO2 on my monitor. But then, as I start to breathe out, it does just like that, all right? Again, this also shows that I've got a much shorter inspiratory time than I do expiratory time. Because it takes a lot longer for us to get the waste products out. So that's normal. Usually, um, um, if I remember correctly, a normal IE ratio is like a 1 to 2. So for every 1 second you spend breathing in, you should expect 2 seconds breathing out. Following me? All right. Um, the alveoli in the lower lung is more perfused but less ventilated. So if you think of your very low portions of your lung, why would they be more perfused? Right, so they're, they're closer to, to the, the, the um, pulmonary vasculature there where we have the main pulmonary vasculature. Now, of course, you've got your arterioles and your capillaries that go up and they wrap around everything there. But they're closer to the main pulmonary vasculature there. Now, they also get to they sit a little bit longer. Why are they less ventilated? Because of dead air space. Remember that? And remember that, 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 that when you're breathing in, you've got that around 150 milliliters of, of air that kind of hangs out in that dead air space that... that that you lose, and then you lose more of that pressure as you go down. In the more proximal uh, respiratory tract, CO2 falls gradually to zero at some point, and so it, it, the, the, the CO2, we're, we're measuring the CO2 as a whole, as a whole, um, and if we were to measure the individual areas of the lungs, they may be a little bit different as we're expiring out. It doesn't really matter, though, because what we're doing is measuring it as a whole. The concentration of CO2 in the alveoli is determined by perfusion and ventilation. Where have we heard this before? VQ mismatch. VQ mismatch. Ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. All right? In order for CO2 to be what it needs to be, we need to have good ventilation, and then we need to have good perfusion. 
Now we've talked about the VQ mismatch. This will give us a little bit better of an indication of maybe what's going on in some aspects. All right. How does the concentration of CO2 in the alveoli indirectly vary with ventilation? If you have an increase in ventilation, you will, may have a decrease in CO of CO2 in the alveoli. All right. Not giving you a chance to switch. Right, right. So, so. Um, um, Think hyperventilation, right? Hey, what do you think? Okay. Um, <coughs> if you got, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, by the way, he said that you call him and every time he walks by, it totally bothers him. Good. So, Good. I, I he won't tell that. me that. Oh, he was like. I mean, he was almost like, yeah, almost freaking to the point of freaking out. It bothers him so much. I told him that he never told us anything. He just called out his name and started clapping. All right. Um, he won't tell me that because he has even worse. All right, decreased ventilation. All right, decreased ventilation would create an increase of CO2 and that'd be a lot. Think hypoventilation, right? What's happening? You're not breathing out quick enough to get it all out and what's happening to CO2. It's just kind of hanging out, right? What about with perfusion? If you got decreased perfusion, you'd have decreased CO2 in the alveoli. That makes, that makes sense, right? If I'm not having the metabolic processes occurring at the cells, I'm not going to have the byproducts returning back, right? If I've got increased perfusion, I may see an increase of CO2 in the alveoli. Now, increased perfusion, though, sometimes may not be necessarily a great thing because when would you need, what situations may you need increased perfusion? All right, shock. You would need increased perfusion, but I'm thinking more of hypermetabolic all right think a little bit simpler <coughs> fever right fever what happens when you have a fever your metabolic processes are sped up right what happens to a kid when when they when they start to have a fever what do they start doing they start breathing really fast right because they need increased perfusion right um what does a, a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis do? They start breathing rapidly, right? Because they need increased perfusion. Okay? Again, the body likes its numbers and it likes that gradient to be kind of just across the board, right? It likes that homeostatic balance. So too much of something or too less of something gets it thrown off. All right? We're going to hit this one more time, and then we're going to uh, look at, at, at start getting more into this uh, the waveforms and things. But what is the difference? Well, on the very most basic um, explanation, the difference in oxygenation and ventilation. Oxygenation is the chemical processes of breathing, right? The gas exchange, the diffusion. Whereas ventilation is the mechanical processes. So we need we need good plumbing, we need good plumbing, we need good tubes, we need good open diameter tubes in order to ventilate. And then we also need good clear alveolar capillary membranes, we need good pulmon pulmonary vasculature, we need good cellular perfusion in order to oxygenate. There are a couple of parameters of, of, of a respiratory assessment that, that you know, but you, you really need to understand why, as paramedics, we're still going to use SpO2 as a monitoring tool, but it's more of a, a, a monitoring tool and not as much of a diagnostic tool, or not as good of a diagnostic tool as entitled CO2 when it comes to ventilation and oxygenation. 
And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's going to read the saturation, the percentage of, of, um, of uh, oxygen on the hemoglobin. And so if you've got changes in ventilation, it may take several minutes for those to be detected. Right? We said that earlier. Because that hemoglobin is bound with that oxygen, and so it's still going to circulate as long as we've got a pump, it's still going to circulate, right? <clears throat> also, when you got pulse oximetry on, that finger needs to be just, just right, right? It needs to be warm, needs to, they need to have good circulation, um, they, they, they need to, to have no nail polish or clear nail polish. Everything needs to be just right. And, and, and more times than not, on critical patients, that SpO2 is not a very reliable tool, right? But with, when we're measuring ventilation and we're measuring the entitled CO2, there's not a lot that can, really, that can really skew that reading other than maybe placement and equipment malfunction, all right? Because we're, we're, we're placing that right on the source. We're sampling the expired air. We're sampling the breathing. So these numbers are coming from the source. All right? Um, so what are we measuring with uh, entitled CO2? The partial pressure or the volume and percentage of CO2 in the airway at the end of exhalation. I think I've honed that in. But the good thing about it is, is that it gives you a breath-to-breath -breath measurement. So each, each waveform that we see, just like with a cardiogram or an car, uh, EKG, each time we see that complex, we're seeing real-time what's happening with the heart. We're seeing real-time what's happening with inspiration and expiration. It can give you a little bit of information on inspiration, too, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. All right? Not typically affected by motion artifact, distal circulation. Well, it certainly isn't by distal circulation or temperature. The only, the, 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 the big issue, the big issue with your CO2 monitoring, and uh, because they had all the children's expo stuff set up, I couldn't um, find the, the one that goes on the end of the, um, yeah, I couldn't find the, uh, the, the ET2 monitoring. Um, but if you can imagine just for a minute, that if we've got the end that you put on the, the ET tube on this, all right? A couple of issues you may run into. One of them, this is a pretty flimsy tube, right? What happens when, in some patients when you intubate them? I'm trying to figure out, uh, I'll just tell you. Um, uh, Sometimes patients may have aspirated and you get crap up, or let's say you've intubated somebody with pulmonary edema and you're getting that junk up from the lungs, or somebody with pneumonia and you're getting that sputum up. What may happen is that that junk gets and it clogs up your lines very easily. Another issue that you run into is that, 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 that um, ET2 is very, very malleable and very very slippery, right? And so we want to secure it in, but now we're attaching another cord to it that we're going to have to monitor very well because it could easily pull it out. Does that make sense? Um, but all in all, if you put this on, it's going, it should give you what you need to know as far as, as when you've intubated a patient or when you put the nasal cannula on. Right. So now, with your SpO2, it will give you a, a, a plethora of waveforms sometimes, but we're not going to talk about those waveforms today. But do know that you, you can have those. If you're measuring CO2, you need to make sure you've got your monitor set to where you get your waveform for your CO2 and your reading there as well. Okay. Um, in order for you to have good perfusion, your VQ match must be um, very close. 
Volume of blood returning to the lungs matches the capacity of the lungs to exchange gases. What are a couple of uh, things that, that do affect perfusion and, and the ratio there? Well, obviously ventilation. If you clog up or if you've got a, a, a kink or a, a plug in the plumbing, what's going to happen? You're not going to have ventilation, right? What about cardiac output? You know, cardiac output, that's my big thing there. Well, how does cardiac output, how would that affect? It has to produce or move enough blood through the lungs that it appropriately exchanges the gas. All right. And so, so we typically think of cardiac output as being the amount of blood leaving the left ventricle, right, to perfuse the body. But in reality, you've got two pumps, right? You've got your right ventricle and your left ventricle. You need good cardiac output from your right ventricle. Why? That's right, that's right. So, so you need a good pump with your right ventricle. Now, of course, that pressure is much lower. But then you need a good left ventricular cardiac output, too, because what's happening there? That's right, it's sending the oxygenated blood to the body, which is going to be the basis of perfusion, right? We can all day long have a right side that's pumping good and getting that waste product or that blood that's full of waste up to the lungs, but eventually you're going to run out of blood that's got waste in it if you're not getting oxygen-saturated blood to the rest of the body, right? So that's going to affect your perfusion there. Remember, when we talk about systems, yeah, in classes we break them down into individual systems, but they have to work together, especially the cardiopulmonary system. All right? So, um, if, if, if you're thinking, or if you're, if you're trying to figure out your ventilation and perfusion ratio with each breath, so yeah, we need cardiac output, which is the sum of the stroke volume and heart rate in a minute, right? But what do we look at as far as with each breath? What do we look at as far as ventilation? That's going to be your tidal volume, the amount that's coming in. What do we look at with, with perfusion? Is going to be your stroke volume. So really, you need to have adequate tidal volume coming in and you need to have adequate stroke volume with each stroke. So with the VQ mismatch, something is off, all right? Either ventilation, something's wrong with the mechanical aspect of breathing, or something's off with the chemical processes of breathing, all right? Um, low cardiac output caused by cardiogenic or hypovolemia resulting from hemorrhage won't carry as much CO2 back to the lungs, resulting in a lower CO2. Doesn't necessarily mean the patient is hyperventilating or their arterial CO2 level would be reduced, but you've got reduced perfusion to the lungs alone, which can cause this phenomenon. This is going to be a situation like with, with cardiogenic shock or hypovolemia, where there's really nothing wrong with the lungs, and if they got the volume back that they needed, then, then they would work fine, right? <clears throat> um, but when you've got a VQ mismatch, the big deal here is that you're going to have diminished gas exchange, which will re result in hypoxemia and hypercapnia. And so your, your numbers, your CO2 numbers, may not always just be affected by the rate of ventilation, right? If you think physiologically what's happening, well, that makes sense. If I'm hypovolemic, if I'm hypovolemic, and I don't have as much preload coming back, so then I don't have as much blood going through the right side, and I don't have as much blood coming to the alveolar capillary membrane, then I'm going to expect my CO2 to be lower because I've got a lower amount of volume, right? In turn, I'm going to expect my perfusion status to be lower, right? Which is totally the definition of shock, inadequate cellular perfusion, hypoperfusion of the cells. 
So uh, uh, in turn, I'm going to expect my perfusion status to be lower because if it's cardiogenic shock, I don't have a good pump. If it's hypovolemic shock, I don't have enough volume in the container to transport. And so it's all going to go hand in hand together. Again, just like with anything else, CO2 monitoring is a, a, is a monitoring and a useful diagnostic tool, but you still have to look at your overall patient presentation. Okay? If ventilation is held constant, then changes in entitled CO2 are due to changes in cardiac output. What I just explained to you summed up in, in just one word, or not just one word, but several words in one, one statement. If you are ventilating at a rate of 12, good tidal volume, good chest rise and fall, but then you notice that your CO2 levels are changing based off of what has previously happened to the patient, why you're intubating the patient in the first place, that's probably going to be the underlying cause of your changes in CO2. Y'all are about to fall asleep on me, so let's, a couple of y'all are, a couple of y'all are, so let's take a, just a five minute stretch break. All right, so we've talked a good bit about, um, about the, the aspects, of the, the, the physiological aspects of, of CO2 monitoring. And so we're going to spend the next little while uh, talking about the clinical applications and, and why we would do this and what we look for. Um, one of the first ones that comes up is um, ensures proper exhaled CO2 levels for head trauma patients. And this has goal is to maintain normal levels of CO2. Where, where does CO2 and oxygenation come into play with increasing intracranial pressure in head trauma patients? Where does that come into play? Okay, all right. Certainly, um, one of the, one of the parts of Cushing's triad is, is irregular respirations, right? So you've got what hypertension bradycardia and irregular respiration. And so typically though with that aspect, the irregular respirations aren't necessarily because of deficits in O2 or CO2, but it's more of what? All right, intra increasing intracranial pressure, that's the cause of it. But the, the reason why is because of the increasing pressure in the brain, you're putting pressure on the brain stem, right? The medulla, the pons, and, and, and so you're going to start seeing like your, maybe your, your ataxic or your Beaux respirations or things like that. But now as far as, as your CO2 levels and your oxygenation levels, what's one of the things when you were learning, let, think even back to AMT, as far as oxygen as a drug, Oxygen does have some side effects, and what was one of them? Vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction, right? Where on the flip side of that, hypercarbia may cause some vasodilation, right? And so used to, used to, the thought process behind that was, well, on head injured patients, let's hyperventilate them, right? To, to, no, no, hyper. And, and let's, let's try to wash some of this stuff out and maybe control the, the vasoconstriction and vasodilation. But what they found is that ultimately that affected total system perfusion as well. And they found that, that it, it, it's much more logical with a head injured patient to try to maintain a normal CO2 level and, and to watch um, and, and make sure that we're not hyper or hypoventilating. Troubleshoot hypoxemia. So what's one of the first things that we're going to do when we assess a patient? What's one of the first tools that we're going to stick on their finger? A pulse ox, right? 
So that's going to give you one of your first indications other than your, your physical signs, right? Uh, uh, pale skin, bluing skin, decreased respiration, things like that. But we're going to stick that pulse ox on there. We've got O2 sat of 89%. Okay, well then let's, let's if we've got the capability, we've got the ability to, to hook them up to CO2, even if we're not intubating them, but we've got this, let's go ahead and hook it up to give us a little bit more of an indication of really what's going on here. Because, in all reality, we may just not be getting a good reading. Of course, you, you, you got your, your assessment skills. That coffee pot. Uh, you got your assessment skills that are going to give you um, good information as well. Assess for bronchospasm, PE, and other obstructions. All right, so now this is where I really want you to put your thinking cap on in relation to, to those waveforms. So if, if I'm breathing my inspiratory, then I've got my peak and my plateau there. If this is a normal where when I breathe in, I've got good volume, adequate volume coming out, so I've got a rapid increase, a rapid spike. That gives me a good indication that, that, that my ventilation is okay. <coughs> Somebody that has bronchospasm or an airway obstruction. So obviously we're not going to get a lot with the inhalation, but what's going, how is that going to ex, uh, affect expiration? Okay, all right. So initially initially if you if you've got bronchoconstriction especially in the case of somebody that's a retainer think of think of it almost like this you know those animal traps where the animal goes in and it's just like a, a, a narrow tube to where they can squeeze in but then they can't get back out that's 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 kind of the way that you you should imagine something with bronchospasm all right so we're able to get the breath in but as we're trying to expire out, the bronchioles are too tight, so we're not able to get as much out as quickly. So the first thing that's going to be affected is the CO2 levels initially. You're not going to see the rapid spike of CO2. Okay? It's going to be more of a gradual spike, right? And then at the end of, expire, uh, of, of expiration and start of inspiration, you'll see it go down. All right, and so the key here in the different waveforms is your initial spike. All right, this is also called a shark fin because it looks like a shark fin. All right, I guess it would not make sense to call it a dorsal fin or a tuna fin because it doesn't look like a tuna fin. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and this is kind of introduction. We're going to actually throw some waveforms up here in just a minute for you to, to put it together. But yes, ma'am. Isn't that the like, primary indicator of an asthma attack, like a nail in the coffin kind of, this is an asthma attack? Yeah, it, 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 especially if you've got other clinical symptoms that are going along with that. And again, I, 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 I like to enforce or reinforce that, even with cardiac monitoring. You treat your patient, right? You treat the monitor too, all right? So the, that's not 100% accurate, treat the patient, not the monitor, because your monitor tells you a lot. But you've got to have your clinical assessment, your, your clinical application to what you see here, and if you can correlate the two together, then yeah, if I've got that patient that's <laughs> history of asthma and all that, and then I see a rapid rate with that shark fin, there you go. You know what I mean? But then sometimes you may have this patient that's just in respiratory distress and you really can't get to the bottom of it um, because not all the time are you going to just get just the, these, these very prevalent and apparent wheezing sounds. But then on the flip side of that, not everything that wheezes is asthma, right? Um, 
Also, it, it can assist with monitoring the effectiveness of chest compressions. This is probably one of the most important, most important aspects of CO2 monitoring. Cardiac arrest management, have that entitled CO2 monitor on, watching it, it'll give you indication of good chest compressions, good ventilations, but it also can give you indication of return to spontaneous circulation. How, well, let's, let's wait before I ask that, all right? This is what I was talking about earlier. There's not a huge difference between your arterial uh, PaCO2 and your entitled CO2. Um, there's not a huge difference between the two, all right? Um, now, there, there's some basic rules. Kind of a, a guideline of, of troubleshooting, if you will, and you will, um, for if you start seeing different things when you're monitoring, all right? So let's say that we're, we are, um, we're trucking right along, we've intubated a patient, we got good waveform, and they, um, they've shown waveform, but then suddenly it drops. That waveform drops, that number drops. The first thing that that's going to tell me is what? Not, not clinically with the patient, but the first thing that's going to tell me is that the monitor is not getting a readout of CO2, right? But just like with all equipment, the first thing we always do if we have anything that changes, especially something that is a very big, noticeable change, is to do what? Check the patient. Check the patient. Check your ET tube. Because what may have happened is that it's become dislodged and now we've got an esophageal intubation. So how, what are we going to do? If I've got this and, and I've, I've been bagging, we've got a good, good waveform and suddenly it drops, now I know I need to assess my patient, what's the first thing I'm going to listen to? I'm going to check lung sounds first, then I'm going right to the gut, right? <laughs> then I'm going to check compliance, then I'm going to check chest rise and fall, then I'm going to look at, does this 70-year-old man suddenly look like he is 36 weeks pregnant? That happens. That happens. That stomach will get really big. All right? If I've confirmed that I still have good placement, I'm getting good chest rise and fall, I'm getting um, easy compliance, the very next thing I'm going to check is the connection here. <coughs> is it still connected? Then the very next thing I'm going to check is, do I got a clog of puke in the, the, the circuit, all right? Other um, things, a sudden decrease, but not to zero. So that's the big deal here. If it drops to zero, you're not getting anything, anything out. So there is a breach somewhere, all right? Sudden decrease, um, but it's not to zero. You may have a leak in the, uh, the, the, the circuit. It needs to be a closed circuit. If I've got a leak anywhere between that, that uh, expired breath and the monitor, I'm going to lose some of that sample, right? Um, what, about, what about we've got an exponential decrease of entitled CO2? So let's say that we've got a good waveform, we're trucking along in about 40 then that entitled CO2 drops to, let's say, maybe 15, but I've still got a waveform. So that's going to tell me, hey, i still got a waveform, so I'm still getting CO2 out, so my placement's still good, but physiologically, I may have something going on now. I may have suddenly developed a PE. The patient may have suddenly went into cardiac arrest, and so now their own me metabolic pathways, their own pump isn't working, right? Sudden hypotension or severe hyperventilation. What about if you've got a change in the CO2 baseline? So everything else looks the same, but, but now my baseline, my waveform's looking raggedy. That's going to probably be a equipment issue, okay? Now on the flip side of that, what if you got a sudden increase in CO2, in entitled CO2? Well, I'll tell you this. If you're working a cardiac arrest patient and you start seeing a, a increase 
and it probably would be more of a gradual increase, but you start seeing an increase of CO2, that's a good sign. That's a good sign, right? Because when we're working a cardiac arrest patient, and we're plugging along, we're doing good compressions, we're, we're bagging, we're still not going to expect to see 35 to 45. Not going to happen. All right? Because 35 to 45 is natural. 35 to 45 is homeostatic. 35 to 45 is what the body does on its own. We're artificially pumping the chest. We're artificially pumping the lungs. Best we're going to get is high teens, low to mid 20s. And that's okay. That's okay. But then I start seeing that CO2 start rising. I'm going to need to be checking my other parameters because chances are this patient's kind of started taking over its own pathways again. And now we've got return. Okay? Um, that, um, these tables in there, um, if, if you really get down to it and you start understanding what we're monitoring here, it would make, it, it makes sense as far as why you would have these changes, okay? So, when we are measuring, when we're measuring, we've got two types of, of CO2 measuring. We've got mainstream and side stream. Mainstream, you've got the CO2 sensor located between the ET tube and the breathing circuit. Where side stream, you've got CO2 aspirated from a sampling tube, and then it's analyzed um, in, in a sensor away from the patient. These are going to be some of your more mobile, smaller devices. And they're accurate enough, but your side stream or your main stream, that's going to give you a real time. Okay? Um, it uses a sensor that is located inside the monitor instead of an external sensor. Um, it's usually pulled, it, well it's pulled through a small tube and uh, from the uh, sample site, usually nasal cannula or mask, and into the monitor. So that type of nasal cannula type thing is but what you put in between on your like ET tube would be a mainstream. And I may, let's see. I'm not 100% convinced that this one hooked up to our monitor is not a mainstream. But there's your mainstream right there. And that's where you have your connection. And we've got those, uh, we've got those connections like on the um, the the Zoll monitors. Yeah, I think that, yeah, this is a, a side stream. This is a side stream. This is going to be a main stream here. It's directly on top of the expired breath and it's going to pull that sample tube in. So these are just some examples of, of the other ones that, that you don't have to eat, the, the nasal cannulas. Um, so, so how does it actually pick up the breath? You've got this um, When it goes in the nose, it goes in the nose, it's got this unit here that actually picks up the sample. Alright, and then it sends it down through your sensor into your monitor. Alright, y'all can pass over and look at it if you want to. Now, would you still hook that nasal cannula up to oxygen? Yeah, it's got a port for oxygen, but it's able to, to disassociate the oxygen and the CO2. Okay? All right. Um, so, your capnogram, it reflects exhaled CO2 concentration over four phases. And what, what are the different things that, that would give us indications of 
or, or what are some of the things that we're looking for? Obstructive diseases, asthma, um, emphysema, things like that. Rebreathing. Rebreathing. What does that mean? Right. So, so you're 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 breathing in CO2 instead of getting rid of it all. You're breathing back in some of that CO2. Mhm. Mm yep. Mhm. Mm um, a curare cleft. A curare cleft. I'm gonna wait till we get to that actual slide to explain that to you. Okay. Esophageal intubation and also endotracheal tube or circuit leak. All right. Um, VQ mismatches, which some of those uh, things that we talked about earlier could um, be in that. Also, uh, apnea. Hyper and hypoventilation, those are going to be pretty easy to identify. And then your pulmonary diseases, your obstructive diseases like we talked about. All right. So, here we are. Here we are. In order to know what's abnormal, you need to know what normal looks like. You needed to know what a normal sinus rhythm looked like in order to detect what was abnormal. You need to know what a normal waveform looks like in order to detect what's abnormal. So again, if you look at your chart, if you look at your graph here, this is your numerical rep, uh, representation, and if you've got capnometry with it, on your monitor in a little box up there, you're going to see your number but you can also correlate your waveform with your number. So, just looking at this alone, we'd say that their CO2 is around 40, right? So, again, think of the, the physiological process of breathing and what's happening. Let's, well, let's just start here, all right? So, here... So if you notice the yellow line, inspiration, kind of goes here, okay? But then it gets flat right there, all right? <clears throat> so what that means is that as I'm expiring, my CO2 levels are rapidly declining, and, and really what you're seeing right here is not a measurement of any CO2. It's more of watching it actually go to zero, all right? So your measurement of your expired CO2 stops at your plateau or your, your peak right there, okay? So as I'm breathing in, I've got flat baseline because there's no CO2 being sampled, right? But then as soon as, uh -oh, as, soon as I expire, I've got a rapid outflow very quickly of CO2. So that's why it makes it spike very quickly. And then I hit that plateau, right? As part of my expiratory ratio there, I hit that plateau. Where it just levels off, all right? Then as I get ready for my next breath, my CO2 has been expired out. I'm sucking in, I'm going back to zero. So I'm losing any tracing of a um, CO2, okay? Now, here is the phases. So, it put it in A, B, C, D, and E. But you, they're also 1, 2, 3, 4. So, phase 1 is your inspiratory baseline. Phase 2 is your expiratory upstroke. Phase 3 is your expiratory plateau, where you're leveling off. Then phase 4 is your expiratory downstroke, or representation of your inspiration. Okay, so baseline, we're breathing in. This is where you start, phase two is where you start seeing the appearance of CO2. This is where you would expect CO2, right? You want CO2 to show as soon as you start exhaling. Phase three, your expiratory plateau. This is where your CO2 levels pretty much stay constant. There's not a big difference there, all right? Um, but it does have a little bit of a slant there, all right? Then phase four, initiation of the respiratory phase, which leads to your baseline. So the, the drop-off uh, of the expiratory phase, is that the initial, is that the uh, equal atmospheric pressure? Have you, 
get that part right there? At the point. At the point? At yes, the, yes. And so once it starts going down, you're starting to inspire then, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then it plateaus at the bottom when you stop the inspiration, right? Right, right. When you're, so when you're, when it back up. right. All so, right. so, let's see if I can do this, all right? So, let's imagine I'm at my peak there, so I'm right there, all right? So here I go. Make sense? Do y'all see that? Does that make sense? All right. So this is called a fast catenogram, just a high-speed catenogram that gives you real time, okay? So here we go, slanting and prolonged phase two and increased slope of phase three. This is what I was talking about, the sharp fin, right? So as I was drawing this just a minute ago, I had a, a very rapid outflow, right? If I've got obstruction, I'm gonna to struggle to get that air out. So it's gonna be a prolonged slant there and then, once I finally get it out, then I'm going to try to get back another breath. All right? So what is this? What falls under this? Obstruction or spasm. Bronchospasm, COPD, things like that. Okay? Make sense? All right? Now, look at this one. Does it really, does the waveform itself look different as far as morphology of the waveform? No, it doesn't. But there is one thing that's different about it than a normal waveform. Right. I need it up here, right? I need it in this area. All right. Or... So yeah, this may be, this may be as uh, maybe something in pulmonary embolism. But think a little, even think simpler than that. All right, what would cause hypocapnia uh, or hypocapnia? Yeah. What you say? Hyperventilation. Does that make sense? All right, curare cliff. When they intubate down at Jack Houston, do they hook them up to CO two? Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So curare cleft, a curare cleft, which is which is referencing this right here. All right. What you're actually seeing is you would see this in the time when you've got a patient that is sedated or paralyzed, and we're ventilating for them. But then whatever they had is starting to wear off, all right? So what you're actually seeing right here is that patient attempting to take his own breath. So what you're seeing is you've got, I've, I've ventilated that patient and then now um, he's breathing out, so I've got that, but then suddenly he goes, it tries to take his own breath, but but he's still not strong enough to, to completely do the breath, so we go back to breathing back out. So all that is is just trying to get it out, all right? If the depression occurs in the later third of the waveform, it's referred to as a curare cleft. All right, and then you may even have this right here again, which is pretty close to, to what he was trying to do there. And that's just where he's, he or she's trying to take in their own breath, all right? So what do you do if you've got a patient that you've got on CO2 and you've got them paralyzed or, or you've got them sedated and you start seeing that? What else would you expect to see changes in? Yeah, heart rate, blood pressure, things like that. So let's go ahead and, and, and sedate them a little bit more. Unless, unless we're trying to wake them up. We're trying to get them back away. Okay. 
but that's not going to occur in the field, trying to get them back away, all right? And if, if they were in the hospital, they'd have them on the ventilator, and then they'd be watching that closely, okay? Um, when y'all did, um, when y'all did um, your RT clinicals, did y'all go up to, like, ICU and see some ventilators and stuff? Yeah. Did you ever hear them term bucking the ventilator? Yes. Well, so a lot of times that's in reference to them coughing and things like that. But if a patient was, let's say we had them sedated with propofol or something like that, and and you know they're starting to get uh, accustomed to it or they're starting to it's starting to wear off a little bit, um, sometimes we start hearing that ventilator alarm when they're trying to take their own breath as well. And so that would be pretty much the same thing as that, except this is just a waveform that you may see. All right. Very rare, I would say, in the field. Um, you know, we, we, we probably won't do a lot of paralyzing in the field unless you get with a critical care unit or in an area that, that protocols are, are more liberal. Um, but, you know, um, you may sedate patients um, who are intubated and things like that. Okay? All right? Now, we talked just a minute ago here where this could be a visual representation of hyperventilation, but what really is key if you're trying to tell hyperventilation, and I just wanted y'all to think just kind of out of it a little bit to, to, to relate the numbers here, all right? But if this is held constant at low levels, if this is held constant at low levels, then most likely, likely you've got some other physiological patho <coughs> physiological process going on. This is what you would probably expect a little more with hyperventilation. Shorter and decreasing, decreasing. Not a, a low level of CO2 held constant, but decreasing because what's happening as you hyperventilate, you're washing CO2 out. What also do you notice about the baseline there? So we're not getting all the way back to zero. So we're not getting time. We're not getting time to completely rid all the CO2 and take in a good breath. There's even probably some rebreathing of CO2 in this situation. What about a right main stem intubation? Well, let me ask you this. If you've intubated somebody and you do a right main stem, does the left still get anything? It does, it does. So it's not completely cut off. It's certainly not viable. It's not a viable intubation. Um, but it does get a little something. All right? But what's happening is with the right main stem, we're pretty much having two independent ventilations, right? So my right side's getting everything, my left side's getting a little bit, and then it's going to come out. And that's what you're going to see here. All right? The initial peak is due to the uh, CO2 from the well-ventilated right lung, and then the second peak is most likely due to the prolonged expiratory time of the poorly ventilated left lung. So just really think for a second what's happening here. You're ventilating the right side, the right side's getting more full of air, so it's going to have a quicker response to expiration, right? But the left side still got a little bit, and it still needs to, to expire, but it's going to be slower. So that's all you're seeing here. So initially, you're seeing this, right? So this would indicate right. And then right here, the left is slower, so it's probably going to build up CO2, and it didn't get quite as much oxygen, so CO2 levels are going to be a little bit higher. And then you go back, okay? Y'all follow me? Does that make sense? It's really not that hard, is it? I mean, it really is not at all. It's, it's nowhere near as complex as looking at an EKG strip. What about an esophageal intubation? Well, the first thing that you're not going to expect is what? CO2. What if they just, just chug down that uh, Coke Zero there? Might be a little bit, but it's going to be a, a artifacty baseline, and it ain't going to be much, right? 
There might be a little residual CO2 in there, but it ain't going to be much. But the key here is that you've got to have that waveform. All right? <coughs> what else um, may you just see a base, just baseline flat? Yeah, if, if, if you've got a, a breach in the circuit there or if, if, if it's clogged up or something like that, all right? Um, an air leak, an air leak, one of the big things here is that you're going to see just this non-returning baseline. It's just going to look <coughs> very whack. This does not represent a breath at all, all right? Because what are we doing with an air leak? We're losing most of the sample. Yeah, that's leaking air. Thanks, Sabre. <laughs> now, them kids, them kids always making life difficult. I love my children. But, just like with anything else, their anatomy and physiology is a little bit different. And they may have uh, faster respiratory rates, smaller tidal volumes, longer response times to cat and grass, higher metabolism. Um, and so ultimately you would want to probably see just a, a good normal waveform. Now, of course, based on their age, you're going to have variations in respiratory rate, which is normal. Um, but um, you know, sometimes you may have some other variations as well. What I would recommend to you, though, is, is try to try try to correlate what you're seeing with the way they're presenting. If they are wheezing and you see shark fin, but it doesn't look exactly sharp like that adult shark fin, it's still more than likely obstruction, right? Does that make sense? Um, but big deal here is that I want you to, to know um, what to look for with adults first and foremost. Alright? So what do you think this is? We've got a progressively increasing CO2. Hypo. So what do you think this is? Hyperventilating. Alright. Easy? Easy enough? All right, so other stuff, of course, carbonated uh, beverages in the stomach can result in some abnormal uh, capnograms. It's going to be kind of kind of far-fetched to see something like this, or even this. Um, you, you probably have to guzzle a lot of CO2 to, to have something that's going to give you any kind of waveform in the stomach because what does the stomach not do when you, when you um, <coughs> push air into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, again, with equipment malfunction and stuff, if you're trucking along and nothing's really changed for your patient, and you start seeing these really weird waveforms, of course, check your patient first, but most likely you've got an equipment malfunction. Um, Those, those sampling tubes, they're designed to, to, to withstand a little while, um, but they're not designed to withstand prolonged monitoring. I mean, we had to change ours in the ICU like every six hours um, and because they just they get clogged very easily and those samplings don't, don't work for a long time. All right? Um, What would a rise in CO2 level during CPR mean? Yeah, possible return of circulation. Now, what do you do if you're if you're if I'm in my cycles and I look here and I see an increase <coughs> in CO2? What do I do at that point? <coughs> yeah, go just, just finish up your cycle continue doing what you're doing right there. It's just like when, when you, when you um, um, shot somebody, you continue your cycle for a, for a little bit, all right? Um, all right, let's see if this will pull up. All right, so this is a pretty neat little thing here. Um, 
I did it yesterday. What you're going to see is the waveform, and then you're going to see four options at the bottom of what you may think it is. Before you call it out, before you call it out, let's look at it really quickly. So Mark, a motorcyclist, was involved in a severe motor vehicle accident. As a result, he was intubated, ventilated, and transported by air to the closest level one trauma center. What does his waveform indicate? He's got an entitled CO2 of 50, SpO2 96%. happening with that baseline. <laughs> Who says re breathing? <coughs> Raise your hand. All right. Who says partial airway obstruction? Who says hyperventilation? Who says bronchial obstruction? Re breathing. And how do I know that? Because my baseline is not going back to zero. I've got a constant CO2. I need that baseline of zero, right? What is rebreathing? Um, rebreathing is, is uh, you're breathing out your CO2, but it's not all washing out, and so you're breathing back that CO2 back in. Kind of like the, um, the, the, the breathing in a paper sack deal there. For whatever reason, folks thought that was a good idea for, for um, um, hyperventilation. Um, also, the same the same premise as a non-rebreather mask has the one-way valve so that you don't breathe that CO2 back in. All right. And so again, what 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 is significant about that is that that sampling tube is still picking up CO2 as I'm breathing in. Does that make sense? when it really should be picking up no CO2 as I'm breathing in. So what that's telling me is that, it, that CO2 is just cycling. Breathing it in, breathing it out, breathing it in, breathing it out. Okay? Daniel, a normally healthy child started complaining of shortness of breath during gym class. What can you see in this entitled CO2 waveform? Alright, shark fin. But now, wh what do I see about my CO2 level right now? It's okay, but it's certainly on the high end. But this is where I can correlate some other things, right? SpO2 is 90%. What else do I want to be listening for with this cat? Wheezing. Need to be asking the nurse, what's his history? So, who says apnea? Who says rebreathing? Who says partial airway? Who says bronchial obstruction? There you go. Easy, right? Helen called for the ambulance complaining of shortness of breath. On arrival, you find an unconscious patient on the living room floor. Apnea? Sorry, Helen. Sorry, Helen. <laughs> Let's see what this says. Due to the growing use of pain medication and sedative agents for patients on the general care floor, as well as patients undergoing procedural sedation, there's increased need for aspirin. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go to the ICU. Just because the waveforms are, are the same, no matter where you're at, and I just I want to see them. So. <laughs> Sandra arrived at the ICU with an acute case of substance abuse that led to respiratory failure. She is now intubated and mechanically ventilated. In the last few minutes, the capnography monitor presented the following waveform. What does the waveform indicate? All right. She's mechanically intubated. ETCO2 is 23. SpO2 is 95. 18 respiratory rate. And her pulse rate is 92. So... All right, who says hypocapnia? Who says partial airway obstruction? Who says apnea? And then nobody is going to say that, all right. Look at it, look at it. If it was just hypocapnia alone, you would have a, a 
smooth looking waveform, but you would have a consistently low CO2 level, consistently low plateau. Does that make sense? <coughs> so it could be something wrong with the, like something's in the sampling tube, or it could be something is in her lungs or in the pump. Yes, and, and in her case, if you look here, in her case, uh, go back. We don't want to talk to Lily right now. What were we talking about? Sorry. This is Stone Mountain. It's the oh, yeah, you were talking about <laughs> if it was a obstruction in the tube, uh, you're usually not going to have a partial obstruction. So that tube is so small that if there's crap that gets in there, there, it's not going to usually be able to make its way to make any waveform. With with her, I would be checking tube. I would be checking to see what's up with that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And I can guarantee you, if she's on a ventilator, it ain't going to take the CO2 alarm to get your attention. If with the way that she was breathing on that ventilator, that ventilator is going to essentially just go nuts. It's going to blow up like just making all kinds of noise. All right. So Harry, <laughs> old Harry is post-cardiac arrest, has been in ICU for three days. He is unconscious, intubated, and mechanically ventilated. During the past two hours, his ETCO2 has decreased. What does this indicate? So his ETCO2 is 28, SPO2 is 92, 10, and 82. So rebreathing, hyperventilation, normal waveform, or hypocapnia. Who says hypocapnia? Most everybody? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Good job, guys. Y'all just saved Harry. Walter was admitted to the ICU with, with y'all already looking at that waveform and made your mind up. His respiratory status is monitored with capnography and SPO2. What does the capnography waveform and pulse oximetry data indicate? Alright, let's go to the to the OR. Oh, Joanne, you superficial. Lady going for some plus. No, I'm just kidding. She might have got hit in the face with a stop sign or something. She is sedated with propofol and a respiratory condition is monitored and with capnography and SPO2. In the last few minutes, her monitor uh, present presents the following waveform. Looks a lot like that other one, doesn't it? You see her levels are starting to drop. Correct case, guys. Correct case. Solid work. Solid work. All right, Mr. Jack. He's going for an endoscopy. Let me tell y'all something. Let me tell y'all something. My wife, she works endoscopy. She, she, um, they have um, anesthesia that comes and gives propofol and things like that now, but used to they just did, um, um, like Bert said, and, and Demerol and things like that. And, uh, if this happens, and this has happened a couple times to her, like, she is not a critical care person at all. Like, <laughs> she's like, I'm just here to get meds and, and, and help the doctor put tubes up butts and stuff. And, and But I mean, you start dying on me, I'm calling somebody else. But, yeah, this, this, this can happen. And, and also, sometimes, sometimes you got to remember that, that and, and there is practical application in the field with this, is that... Not every patient is the same when it comes to response to medications. So what may take 10 milligrams of morphine to ease my pain in the slightest bit may put Jack Bender into cardiac arrest because his body is not, does not respond to it the same way. Does that make sense? So what y'all think is up with this guy? <laughs> All right, Alex, chronic bronchitis. While performing an outpatient bronchoscopy in moderate sedation, his respiratory status is monitored with capnography and SpO2. They yield the following information: ETCO2 45, SpO2 90%, 22 respiratory rate, pulse rate is 110. And he got that history there too. Yep. Yep. All right. That's not Sarah. There you go. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> All right. She went to the pacemaker, got a, uh, or she went to the cath lab, got a pacemaker. 
She's now being monitored. What is this waveform? There you go. All right, congratulations, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you all saved.